Taika, Legend of a Warrior, Part 4, The Dark Torah. It is Kyoto, in the year 2002, and on the banks of a river, near the Osaka mansion, he stared into her deep brown eyes. Even on this night, her face glowed with joy. She loves him unconditionally. I am afraid of this night. The end will surely come for our eternal enemies, the Osaka Samurai. I don't want her to be here. I don't want to lose her. But she always gets her way. As soon as the others join, I give her a soft kiss on her lips. She overpowered me and gave me a more passionate kiss. Then we put our hood on our heads and our masks. The time is now for the assault. They were in the midst of celebrating a wedding and their guard strength would be low. All the training that I was given from this day to the day that we are here tonight from my abduction will pay off. My rival is also here, the son of the head of the Togo clan. David Ito hates my guts and the legend that surrounds me. He barely speaks to me because he feels that he should be in charge. We are all in place and the festivities are getting louder. I look to my left and I look to my right. The signs of all nods came back to me and I gave the go-ahead. The attack began, everyone rushing silently towards the structure at a hundred yards away. We all separate according to plan. On the inside of the mansion, a guard paces in front of a window. David crashes through the window, landing on one knee with his face back away from the guard. The guard draws his sword but stops in his tracks. Sparks of electricity jump out of his chest. His body separates along the lines of a diagonal slash. David walks away slowly. A mile away in the garden on the grounds, Dashuga Osaka, the head of the family, is picking flowers for his pregnant wife, the lovely Ryoko. He is a very tall man, standing at nearly seven feet tall and very muscular. An explosion at his home catches his attention. He mounts his horse and charges home. There is blood and carnage in the mansion. For centuries, the pyrokinetic samurai had the advantage over the woeful ninja. But on this night, after centuries of planning and the combination of their key energy and electrokinesis, tonight the ninja expects to terminate every memory of the Osaka family. There are fires blazing everywhere and the bodies of men, women and children begin to fill every corner with blood lining wall after wall. Derek has become sick to his stomach seeing all of the needless death and destruction. He wonders if there was a better way. Ryoko hides her two children in the panic room in her bedroom. She conceals the entrance then tries to lock the bedroom door. David pulls the door out of her hand. I found you, he laughs. She tries to slash him with her naginata, to which he defects quite handily. She tries again with her blade on fire. He backflips out of the way and she charges at him. In her pregnant frame, she intends to save the lives of her children. She fights him fiercely, backing him all the way downstairs. She knocks him off his feet. 
From the floor, he uses a blast of key, hitting her in the chest. The blast sends her 30 feet away, knocking her unconscious. Derek walks into the room to find David standing over her with his blade sword stroking her face. Leave her alone. We've done enough, pleads Derek. She wakes up crying, begging for her life to be spared. None isn't left alive. Those are my father's orders, David replies. She begs for mercy, but he slits her throat. Her body shudders, and with her last breath, she whispers a curse upon David's family. If you do not have the stomach to lead them, then you shouldn't be doing so. He turns to Derek and licks the blood from his blade. At that moment, Dashuga crashes through the thin wall with his blade ignited with fire, the double-edged blade of his axe. He sees his wife's lifeless body. He screams her name and drops to one knee. Derek, standing closest to Dashuga, backs away. Dashuga falls into the grips of a massive rage. His anger stirs. He uses his power to engulf his entire body in fire. He attacks Derek. He swings violently at him. Such intense swings uses most of his strength, a strength that is too much to bear. Derek's heart is not in this fight because he understands the man's grief. David runs away. Derek only defends himself, but he is kicked in the face and falls to the floor. Minaroku runs her blade through Dashuga from the back to front, but this has no effect on him. He picks her up and flings her through the window. He pulls the sword out of his back. He senses Derek and uses the same sword to block the ninja's katana. Derek's sword, blue with electrokinetic energy, is wielded with anger. Derek knocks his sword out of his hand and then blasts the enemy with electricity. This blast undoes the French braided ponytail, giving Dashuka lots of pain, driving him to his knees. Derek dashes out of the broken window to look for his love. He tries to jump through the window, but Dashuga pulls Derek back into a big bear hug, trying to burn him alive. But he counters by sending a jolt of 4,000 volts into his enemy's body. He is released and jumps outside to rescue his love. Dashuga lies on top of his dead wife, sobbing away at his loss. Derek, while exiting through the nearest window, he stops to observe Dashuga's grief for his wife. He feels a bit of sadness, reflecting on the loss of his parents, and he rejoins his brethren. On his return, Derek petitions the Toga clan leader to be released from his contract, as he has fully completed the prophecy. The master agrees that it is time for him to return to his true homeland. He then turns to a special armor that has been on display for centuries. It is the armor worn by Wedge Pierce, Derek's ancestor. He is known by the name of Daika, standing for the Great Change. It was he that res reversed the losses incurred in the war against the samurai, against Toga's men.
the gift was accepted with great pride. At Narita International Airport, Derek finds himself bored. While on a long wait to board the plane, he makes a journey to the gift shop where he stumbles across a very beautiful, a very voluptuous being. At her very sight, he loses himself in the vortex of her beauty. That is a beautiful thing around your neck, says De Derek. Is it a black pearl? What happened to the rest of it? What happened to it? He tries to talk to her but fails miserably, causing her to suffer a, an acute case of being thoroughly annoyed. He is forced to retreat. Later on the plane, Derek finds that he is seated next to the same beauty from the gift shop. A long truce is agreed upon, just until their destination, Gilcor International Airport. At GCA, they part their ways with the hopes of never seeing each other again. She takes a cab, and he takes his own. He is headed to his sister's house. Twenty minutes later, he finds his way to the large home. He pays the taxi driver, and he turns around with his bags in his hand. He isn't sure about going to the door, but with no other choice, he swallows his fears and heads to the door. He knocks on the door again and again. He awaits for a while, but no one answers. As he turns away, the door opens and a beautiful woman stands in the doorway. Yes, can I help you? asks Janelle. When he turns around, her eyes lighten up. She rushes over to hug him and she hugs him tightly. She is happy to see her long lost brother. She invites him inside to meet her family. And with everything said and done, he is allowed to stay there for as long as he needs to. Later that evening, he has dinner with his sister, her two children, and her husband Scott. They catch up on old times, as there is much laughter and good cheer. At the end of the meal, Derek helps his sister with the dish cleaning. The house is still and the hour is late. Derek sleeps on the sofa downstairs, but is awake by the sound of three men entering the front gate. He watches them through the front window as they split up. Two of the men head for the front door while the last one goes around back. Derek grabs his sword as the two try to open the front door, he opens the door, swinging left and right, killing both. And by this time, the third man has entered the house and started fishing around the house. He walks into the living room, calling for his friends. Their bodies stop him in his tracks. Thoughts of horror fill his head. What have, could have possibly done this to them? He asks himself, but before he can turn and leave, Derek grabs him from behind, and he tries without success to free himself. He tries more desperate measures to get free, including stabbing Derek in the leg. The pain shoots up to his head, causing him to grip tighter, releasing his rage, hitting his unknown this unknown man which as much as 200,000 volts, but rapidly increasing it, surging up to a constant 500,000 volts. This happening has an adverse effect on both men. It turns Derek's pupils white and the tip of his ponytail white. And after more than five minutes, the man's body turns into a pile of ashes at Derek's feet. 
What the hell are you? Screams his sister. Straight away, she orders him out of her house, which is no good for Derek, as he knows nowhere else to go. She, su she suggests that he goes to the home of Dr. Maxwell Lobos, a family friend. But first, he must dispose of the bodies and clean up the mess. She gives him contact lenses to conceal his eye issue. She sends him on his way with the possibility of future visits. Walking on his way to Dr. Lobos' house, he almost is ran over by a pizza delivery guy on a scooter. The guy turns around to apologize to Derek, and, as it so happens, it is his classmate from their local primary school. His name is Todd, and is now a bit of on the portly side. They spend a few minutes catching up. As Todd reveals that his job is hiring, Derek assures Todd that he will come by his workplace soon to fill out the application. But Derek continues on his way to the new place of residence on the edge of the city. It is an eerie looking manor with a long driveway filled with loose gravel. He uses the large ring of a knocker to get the occupant's attention. A few seconds later, the massive doors open slowly, creaking loudly. Standing in the doorway is a very short man with a very large dome-shaped head. His eyeglasses are round and somewhat foggy. He sits oddly misplaced on the top of his head. Good evening to you, young man. Come inside. Your sister has already called me. You can stay on the room in the left, but I must warn you that you have that I have a terrific headache and I may need to boil some milk, or you can do it for me. Whole milk only, obviously. None of that other nonsense. But remember, you must stay out of my lab and any room with a red marker. Good night to you, long, young lad. I will talk to you in the morning, says Dr. Lobus. Derek puts his things up in his new room. He takes a shower, and after which he examines his eyes and his hair. In the middle of the night, the good doctor wakes Derek. Please, Derek, my head pains are back. Please go out and get me some milk. I have no more, please. Don't be long. Here is the money. Go now. About ten minutes later, Derek walks into a somewhat busy and small convenience store. He walks to the milk cases, where he bumps into a, the same woman that he met on the plane. And her name is Sally, only it turns out that she is a police officer. Hello, how are you? Oh, it's you again. Careful, I can arrest you now. But don't be cruel, says Derek. Are you going to give up? asks Sally. No, I won't. Good. Now you can tell me about yourself, she says. The conversation begins, and at some point, Derek, not being familiar with conversations with women in, from the West, reveals that he needs a new lover in his life since he lost the love of his life in Japan. And while the convenience store shenanigans ensue, Dr. Lobos slumbers in his house. He has fallen into a deep sleep 
while waiting for Derek to return. He begins to dream, and in his dream, he stands in an open field on a cold night. He is a little boy again, wearing his favorite little baseball cap. He turns around to see his childhood home behind him. It is an old and rickety structure. And he looks down by his feet, finding his favorite toy as a child, a paddle ball. He picks it up and smiles. He is filled with joy and he plays with it, hoping to beat his best record of consistency. Just then, an old-fashioned nurse appears in front of him. She greets him and tells him that his mother is in labor and is about to give birth. He should come quickly, and she takes him by his hand, gently taking him to the house. He is very nervous and doesn't know what to make of the situation. In the first room, just behind the front door, is a large wooden table with his mother laying on top. The midwife, who is a tall and bony, gray, unkempt hair woman, brings in a metal basin of warm water. She warns him to stay out of the way. She starts her work. The baby's head come out. His mother screams in agony. The baby has only one slanted and stretched eye. She places the baby on another table. Why won't you give me my baby? She, she asks. And the midwife instantly replies, Because you are having twins. Come here. See? Look. I can feel the twin, other twins coming out. While she is delivering the baby, the first baby begins to grow into an adult. Into an adult. The next baby is a three-dimensional shadow and it instantly turns into an adult. What is going on? Where are my children? The midwife is in shock and a loss for words. The second son walks over to mother, giving her a hug. From her shock and overwhelming fear, she breathes her last breath. Their first ch child walks over as a full adult. You killed her! Why did you do that? S says the firstborn. I didn't do anything, said the secondborn. The firstborn drops to his knees, sobbing his eye out. The secondborn calls to his brother, brother an idiot. He turns his back and the firstborn punches a fist straight through his brother's chest and then he throws him into the wall. The wounded brother sends a flying punch into his brother's face. Their epic battle rages on for two minutes but with the younger beginning to lose the battle he runs directly at Lobus. Lobus backs up the second one, the second child, jumps into his forehead. He is awakened from this nightmare. His ears start to ring and his eyes fill with tears. He can barely cope with the sheer pain he is experiencing. He drops to his knees as Derek comes through the door. Don't worry, doctor. I have your milk says Derek. A vertical line streaks down the doctor's forehead. He takes a deep relaxed breath and looks over to Derek and smiles. The second born reaches through the doctor's forehead, slowly pulling himself free. Where is this place? Who are you two? asks the second born. Two seconds later, the firstborn jumps out of the hole as well. He is angry and shouting, 
asking where his his brother. His brother disappears in the shadow of a chair. Who are you? What do you want? asked Derek. The firstborn's blue orb on his chest glows purple. He sends an energy blast at Derek, which at the time he uses his key energy to disperse it. He laughs at Derek and then licks his lips. He attacks with a combination of physical strikes and energy blasts. This keeps him on the defensive as he is more concerned with Lobos, doubled over in the fetal position. The first one laughs, asking why doesn't Derek attack, insulting and calling him names, daring him to do more. And while all of this is going on, the second born walks out of the door as a shadow. The duel between Derek and the firstborn continues for another five minutes until the firstborn issues a warning and vanishes. Lobus is checked and is determined to be okay. While he is recovering, he asks Derek if he would make sure to determinate the two, determinate the two beings which sprung from his cranium. After some thought, Derek agrees to this latest challenge, and after reviewing the massive damage to the house, he knows that he must be very careful. Be careful to make sure that these unexplained things are destroyed, that is, uh, no cost to his own life. He knows now, above any other time, his training will matter. For tonight, he must become once more a hunter. Derek collects his things, his weapons, his equipment, and goes out into the city to track down these two monstrosities, these impossible beings, one with seemingly little limitless powers, with no known weakness. The firstborn is something new, but Derek, the doctor, is experienced as an assassin and a killer of many. One step at a time, though, he must terminate both of the new beings, or this world will remain in danger. He senses that there is something on top of the Angelo Corporation building, a company that is owned by multi-trillionaire Jeremiah Welch. It is a massive building with 15 floors and covers three city blocks. Security is high but passive. CCTV cameras have been placed on every area of its exterior. Dora uses his ninja spikes to scale the side of the building. At the top of the building, he investigates, looking and listening for the slightest evidence of... Suddenly, a metal rod is thrown at Toro's head, but he uses his sword to quickly deflect it. The second born has changed his color into a light gray to make it easier to see him. He sits on an electric box. Are you here to kill me? He asked. Yes. Why? Because you are too dangerous and you have to be stopped, says Derek. Stopped? Dangerous? But you do not know who I am. You have never seen anything like me before. I could do much, so much good for you and, and your world. Your world is, is, has so much war, so much famine and disease, and your children. Your children are dying of hunger and fear and loneliness even in this great city and very rich city but they will never know who it is that you were right before Derek jams a blade into his, his enemy Sally the police officer 
teleports next to to Derek, grabbing him and ap and teleporting both of them away. They end up twenty feet away from the second born. Well, I I did not know that. Things like you existed in this world. How do you derive so your power? He asks Sally. But Sally ignores him. Derek is very confused. He asks who she are she is, and if she's even human. And she can only reply is that she's only sort of human, but she doesn't think that Derek is human either. So what are you? He asks. She replies, I'm a magician. She snaps her finger, transforming her police uniform into her costume. We can talk later. Follow my lead, she tells Derek. She spins around, hurling giant spikes created out of thin air at the target. He grows to ten feet tall, with multi arms to catch and crush every one of the spikes. But he is hit with eight electrified throwing stars that stun him shortly. Sally runs toward the second one, the second born. Uh, he throws a giant fist at her, which she deflects by waving her hands. But before she can get close enough, he splits himself into twelve instantly on the attack. Sally is forced into defending herself, blasting shots of magic at each attack, knocking them down. Tora goes to work, moving from sword fighting the duplicates to cutting their heads off. The two fighters cut the numbers to three, so he develops 15 more duplicates. This deeply angers Sally, so she splits herself into 20, using all of them to imprison the enemy duplicates inside of energy bubbles. Tora electrifies all of the bubbles with 5,000 volts each. This greatly angers the second born as he cancels his duplicates and emits a shockwave, knocking Tora off the roof and Sally to the ground. He teleports next to Sally, and he stares at the broken pearl around her neck. What a very curious thing. He tries to grab it, but it burns his hand, then begins to pull all of his molecules apart. He teleports 30 feet away, examining his hand. What are you? He asks. Sally responds, you have no idea. She snaps her fingers and slowly bit by it. The second born begins to freeze in place. Please don't do this. I only want to help, begs the second born. Tora joins in, running his sword through the second born's chest and pumping 10,000 volts into the wound. No being could withstand that much power, and he certainly does not. The last remaining light of his eyes drifts away. His anguish and pain are no more. His body is turned light blue because of all the electrical energy, and he stands motionless in a cool and crisp light. Sally walks forward with her black pearl growing red even more red as time goes by. Her mid-length hair blows upwards as she mutters something that only she and the pearl could hear. Then the building shakes as if they were in the middle of an earthquake. The erupting power of the black jewel sends the now statue's body to another dimension, locking it safely from their current world. Tora stands staring at her, She rolls her eyes and reveals that her friends call her Sally, but her real name is Sandra Maria von der Beck. I am three, she is 300 years old, 
And yes, she doesn't look like it. She is a member of the Einbach Order, manipulators of the mystic arts. And she wasn't there by chance. And she has been tracking the owner of this building for some time now. The Order has trusted him, her with this pearl because she will need his power to defeat him. It is the most powerful object in our universe. You say that you've been looking for him for some time? How long is some time? 100 years, believe me. It is very hard to track beings like him. He is 1,000 1, years old at least, and he's known as a grill. Well, what's the, what's that? Asked Tora. But she can only ask him to make a deal. That she will help him find whatever he's looking for. And then, when they have finished cleaning up his problem, he will help her with his with hers.